the birds. Anyway, I kind of got out, but I, th I think this will be a very interesting and important program. On Sunday, the 25th, we have uh, Rick Pickren performing Stars and Stripes. It'll be a lot of patriotic songs and some state songs. And that's at, uh, did I say two o'clock? Yes. Um, on Thursday, we have Robert Mueller, or Thursday, not this Thursday, sorry, the July 29th, which is a Thursday. Robert Mueller will be talking about the uh, Battle of the Bulge in World War II and how that it was near the end of the war and it kind of turned, it did turn the tide against the Germans. And he's a great historian and he's been with us before. So um, before we get started, one more note. Uh, all of the programs can be, uh, you can register for all of them just like you did tonight. Go to the uh, website and uh, we'll get the Zoom information to you. Um, we have other things on there too that I didn't talk about in detail like cookbook chat, uh, the book discussion groups and creative coloring. So go on and browse and see what you'd like to uh, take part in and sign up and we'll be glad to see you. So now tonight, uh, as I said, we have Michelle Nichols with us. Uh, she's the astro educator. I love that. I love that title <laughs> from uh, the Adler Planetarium. And she's been with us and given us some great programs. Tonight, she's going to be talking to us, taking us kind of on a search through uh, planets around other stars and their poss the possibility of finding a planet similar to Earth, maybe our future home. Well, maybe not ours, but <laughs> somewhere down along the line, a future home. Yes. So please welcome. Uh, oh, one. see, I almost forgot. If you have any questions, you can either hold them for the end or type them into chat and we'll get to them at the end. So um, please welcome Michelle Nichols. Thank you so much. And uh, Janet, one quick thing. Um, the, the last time I saw a message pop up on my screen, it's on my end, mm -hmm. on my computer, my sound went out. So if if that happens, okay. pop in and let me know since I will Okay, to, yes, so absolutely. If you, if you sense anything uh, technologically okay. strange on my end, <laughs> okay. uh, just come in and let me know. Will do. All right, everybody. Um, so glad you could join us for tonight. This is so great. I wish I could be there with you in person. Hopefully it will be safe for us to do that very, very soon. Soon. Um, I'm very glad that uh, many of you decided to take a little bit of your summer evening and uh, and and spend it talking about some space. So um, my name is Michelle Nichols, and I uh, am the director of public observing at the Adler Planetarium in Chicago. Uh, and uh, I, I get asked this question a lot, especially in the last couple months: When is the Adler Planetarium reopening? Um, figured I'd get that one out of the way. Uh, we are going to fully reopen in March. Um, basically, it's a financial decision to be able to do that. Um, if you heard Janet and me talking uh, uh, a little while ago, um, in order for us to fully reopen in June, we would have had to fully staff up in March. And so we, we weren't able to do that. Um, but uh, never fear, we're still here. Um, and we're going to do a partial reopening starting this Friday and on the weekends, we will be presenting shows in our Sky Theater. So if you happen to be visiting the Shed Aquarium, you want to pop in and see a show, uh, tickets are on sale for that right now on our, off of our website, adlerplanetarium.org. Um, anyway, you can get the latest and greatest news about our full reopening in March. We cannot wait to welcome you all back. But in the meantime, you get me virtually and or in person someday in the near future. So let's, let's dive into this topic. Um, we call it Looking for Earth elsewhere. So let me bring up my PowerPoint and let us go. All right. First off, there is a, a word that's often used in uh, when you're talking about planets around other stars, and that is exoplanet. And I've got the definition of what an exoplanet is. It's a planet outside of our solar system that usually orbits another star in our galaxy. So there's definitely some terms in here that I need to explain. First off, a planet is an object that goes around a star, something that's round, it's big enough, and it goes around a star. That is a planet. A solar system consists of one or more stars and all the stuff that go around the star or stars. In our solar system, we have one star. In other solar systems, there are there may be more than one star. I'll actually give you an example of that in the, in a little bit. 
and a galaxy. What a galaxy is, is a giant collection of stars and all the stuff that goes around the stars. Um, so we live in, uh, or we have one star in our solar system. We live in a solar system. Our solar system is part of the Milky Way galaxy. So um, wanted to make sure we were all on the same page with our terminology. Now, this is often... Uh, what you kind of mentally think of. If I say solar system, you might think of a picture kind of like this. This is sort of your textbook example solar system picture. Um, you've got a, a representation of our sun, you've got a representation of the planets, and they are mostly to scale, not quite, but close enough. Um, I think Jupiter and Saturn are a little too big, um, but that's okay, close enough. Um, but uh, there's a lot of missing stuff in this picture. They definitely don't have all the asteroids or comets or, or the moons, various other things. So there are hundreds of thousands of objects in our solar system. We are part of a place called the Milky Way galaxy. This is approximately what our galaxy looks like. This is a picture of a different galaxy, um, but ours is a pinwheel shape just like this. Um, we don't live in the center. We live about two thirds of the way out from the center. Um, there are these pinwheel shape or spiral shaped arms. We live uh, in one of the spiral arms of our Milky Way galaxy. And the, the key of this search is where are the rest of the planets? Now we think there are lots of them out there. Um, so I'm going to talk about how we search for them, what we found so far, um, and what we hope to find in the future. Now, if you're a fan of Star Trek, like who isn't a fan of, I know there's probably plenty of people who aren't fans of Star Trek, but I'm a huge fan. Um, it's it's one of the reasons I got interested in astronomy was uh, my mom uh, having me watch the uh, Star Trek by the time I came around was the reruns um, in, in the 1970s. Uh, but uh, in season one of the original Star Trek series, uh, the, the doctor, Dr. McCoy says to Captain Kirk, quote, in this galaxy of ours, there are three million Earth-type planets. Well, he, he was he, he he had the right idea with that quote. He's a little bit off. Um, we think that 70 to 90 percent of all stars have at least one planet. Now, I guess the next question is how many stars are in our galaxy? Somewhere in the neighborhood of 400 billion with a B. 70 to 90 percent of all of those stars have at least one planet, if not more. And that's based on the fact that of the stars we've searched so far, that's about the percentage that we see. There are likely a trillion or more planets in our galaxy. That's trillion with a T. Um, there are fewer big ones and more small ones. Multiple planet systems, systems with more than one planet seem to be the rule rather the, than the exception. And then based on the percentages, over 100 million Earth-like planets must exist in our galaxy. And we're going to talk about how we find them. But the first thing we have to, to get around, though, is what does Earth-like mean? Um, and it's, it's an important question because the answer is it depends on who you ask. So what, what does this mean to a variety of scientists? Well, do you mean a planet that's the same size as Earth? If so, Venus is Earth-like. But if you know anything about Venus, you know that the temperature on Venus is approaching about 900 degrees. So if you go by Earth size, Earth gravity, yeah, Venus is very much Earth-like. Temperature, not so much. Um, is it a planet that has a similar mass as Earth, a similar amount of stuff in it as, as Earth has? Hmm, interesting question. Is, is it a planet that has a, a similar temperature range to Earth? Okay, interesting question. A planet that's made of similar things as Earth. Hmm. Is it a planet that has the capability to host life? That doesn't mean that we think it's there. It just doesn't have the ability to host life. Are the conditions right for life? That could be Earth-like. Do you mean a planet with life on it? Could be any life, could be bacteria life, could be, could be moss on the rocks, could be, could be animals in the water. Do you mean with life like us, intelligent life, able to communicate? Um, so there are a huge number of ways you can, you can call something 
Earth-like. And so that, that phrase gets thrown around a lot, especially in the media. Um, but to, to astronomers, all of these are valid questions to ask. And so there is no one right way to answer the question, are there Earth-like planets out there? Again, it just depends on, on who is doing the asking and what they care about in terms of the answer. All right, let's get the elephant in the room out of the way. I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a second because this has come up, I think, in maybe the last five or six programs I've done. What is up with that UFO report? Okay, folks. All right, here we go. Let's get this out of the way. All right, first off. When I'm talking about Earth-like planets, I'm, I personally am not necessarily talking about life like us that can communicate, that can go out in spaceships, out into the rest of the galaxy, all right? Um, it, it's that UFO report, it comes up in every talk, and it's basically, um, there's some stuff out there that we can't necessarily explain right away. Doesn't mean there isn't an explanation, doesn't necessarily mean that all these things are aliens. So the, the UFO report is just one snapshot of one instance, uh, single instances with, with not more than one data point for each one. Um, I get asked a lot, do I think there's life out there in the universe? Well, number one, do the math in terms of the planets. And just, just in terms of what I told you so far, the numbers. Just put the numbers out there. A hundred million Earth-like planets or Earth size, or Earth, or similar to Earth in some way, just in our galaxy. And there are hundreds of billions of other galaxies out there in the universe. Just doing the math that way, yeah, there probably is some life somewhere. We don't yet have satisfactory evidence that that life has visited here. So did they come from an Earth-like planet someplace else? Did they visit here? We, we don't have the evidence for it. Each of those instances in that famed now UFO report means one data point for each one, a grainy video taken from an airplane, uh, a snapshot from a camera. There's nothing else. Um, uh, reports that things have moved in strange ways. And so that's not enough. Um, Although looking for Earth uh, uh, evidence of, of life on Earth from, or from someplace else, that is something we can crowdsource, right? We all have cameras. Where is the evidence there? There are about 7 billion, 8 billion cameras on this planet in our phones. Where's the evidence there? Anyway, I wanted to get that out of the way because I knew that question was going to come up at some point. So let's get back to the talk about how we search for these places where maybe there is an alien out there. How, where, where do they come from? How do we search for these planets? All right, let me get back to my presentation here. Give me a second. All right, how do we even get these planets around other stars? So before we even talk about Earth-like planets, how do we even get planets? Where do they come from? Um, all stars start off exactly the same way. They start off in big giant groups. They, they, they're made in large clouds of gas and dust, all right? Huge clouds. And something causes portions of those clouds to collapse and as they collapse, they heat up and they start making their own energy. That's where you get a star. A star makes its own energy. And again, these stars, most of the time, form in big, huge groups. This is one such group. This is a real picture. Um, this is one of those groups, all right? And then sometimes you get uh, material that is around the individual stars. And in this case, this is another group. Uh, uh, cloud of gas and dust called the Orion Nebula. It's the fuzzy thing in the direction of the constellation Orion in the sky. And we have images from the Hubble Space Telescope that show these disks, these, these dark, dusty disks that are around these stars. Well, the way we think it all works is these dusty disks, some stuff starts clumping together inside these dusty disks and it sticks together, sticks together, gets bigger, bigger, bigger. Some stuff runs into other stuff, gets bigger, bigger, bigger. And then you have planets that can be of varying size. 
And so these, these dusty disks are where you get the planets from and how many you get depends on a variety of things. Um, how much stuff stuck together. Um, uh, did some of the planets get thrown out of the solar system? Did gravity, uh, the, 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 the interactions of all these things, did some stuff get thrown out? Did some stuff uh, get thrown closer to the star? Um, there's, a there's a variety of things that can happen to these planets. So you can get one planet around a star. You can get several, all right? In our case, we have eight or nine, depending on who you ask. Um, and so in our solar system, so somewhere in that range is is the vast majority of the solar systems that we're finding out there. And here are some examples of uh, some of these disks that are around um, some of these stars. And we think that see if you see the gaps, so the star is the thing in the middle, and the dusty disk is this, uh, the, is, they've colored it purple and yellow just so you can see it a little better. And we think that the planets are in these gaps. Um, only one planet has been discovered within a, a disk gap around a star. Um, there are various ways these gaps can occur, but, but at least we found one, so that's cool. Um, so this is how we think we get the planets. And again, they come in varying sizes, and I'll talk about that. Not only that, you need to be the right distance away from your star. It's not enough that you just have a planet that's the right size because you have what's called the habitable zone, sometimes called the Goldilocks zone. If your planet is too close to the star, then your planet can be too hot. If your planet is too far from your star, then it can be too cold. Um, so where we consider a, a habitable zone around a planet is the region around a star where temperatures are right for liquid water to pool somewhere on the surface. For larger, hotter stars, the habitable zone is farther away from the star. For smaller, cooler stars, the habitable zone is a lot closer. Now, finding these, quote, just right planets in the habitable zone is only one of the key to finding signs of life. It is not the only thing we look for. Um, so it's not enough to have a planet in a habitable zone. We have ha found planets in the star's, quote, habitable zone. Um, but again, that's not enough uh, to be considered necessarily Earth-like, um, and it may not be that there's, or maybe that there's that there's nothing there, um, but at least it it gives you a range to search for. Now, when we analyze light um, from a star, uh, we can see what the star is made of. We've been doing that for 150 years. Um, you, you collect light from a star, you send it through a special instrument, and you can split the light into its component colors, and you look for gaps in the light. Now, the gaps tell you um, what ingredients are present in that star. We can do the same thing for these planets. Now, what happens is we need the planet to pass in front of the star. I'll talk more about that in a second. Uh, but we need the planet to pass in front of the star. The light from the star shines through the air around the planet. And when we analyze the light, the effect kind of looks like a barcode. Um, and where these slices of light are missing tells us what ingredients are present in the atmosphere around this alien planet. Now, one pattern of these, of these black gaps in light might indicate methane, another might indicate oxygen, another might indicate some other element or material. Now seeing methane, oxygen, others together could be a strong argument for presence of life on that planet. Now a small rocky world with clouds and oceans and air uh, that's pretty good evidence maybe that life could be there. Now seen by themselves, oxygen, methane, and another uh, material you've heard of, carbon dioxide, um, that doesn't tell us very much. You find them together and that will tell us a lot. Now wouldn't it be really interesting if we might read the pattern of light coming from the air from this planet and it shows burning hydrocarbons. What do we call hydrocarbons? So well, that's burning coal, natural gas, that sort of thing. That would be smog. That would be a telltale presence of, of a sign of potentially life on that planet.
now we haven't found that yet um, but that gives you a little bit of the technology that we're using in order to study not just the planets around other stars but the atmospheres around some of these stars and then what we're looking for we're looking for evidence of what is in the atmospheres of those planets because that can tell us a lot now the first planet that was found around another star was found or announced in 1995 um, it was found around a star called 51 Pegasi, um, and it was initially given the name 51 Pegasi B as the name of the planet. Um, it has subsequently been named officially. The name of this planet is Dimidium, um, but it is a Jupiter-sized planet, big planet, very, very close to its star. It orbits its star once every four Earth days. Let me put that into context. Today is Tuesday. Today is Tuesday at 7 o'clock. Uh, Tuesday, so Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, four days from now at seven o'clock, that planet will have gone around its star once. Four days from that, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday of next week, that planet will have gone around its star again. It takes us 365 Earth days in order to go around our star once. So that was the first one that has been found. I'll give you the number that has been found to date in just a second. Now, where we found these planets, now this is a, an artist's representation of our galaxy. Um, there are some individual planets that have been found. Um, I'll talk about that technique in just a little bit, but the vast majority have been found in a sphere, roughly a sphere, um, around our planet or around our solar system uh, within a few thousand light years. What that means is, um, uh, the distance light travels in a year is called a light year. If you put that in miles, it's about 6 trillion miles. Multiply 6 trillion by about 3,000, and that's the number of miles away that the majority of these planets have been found in. For them, for or a good number of them have been found in that, that sphere, that region close to our solar system. It's just easier to find planets that are closer to our solar system. Um, and so this, this uh, cone right here, this slice of a wedge, um, that's because most of those planets have been found because of one particular telescope called Kepler. Um, and it has found uh, the, the data that we've gotten from that telescope gave us the majority of the planets that have been found using one particular technique, um, again, that I'll talk about in just a little bit. So. But these are the majority of the planets have been found in this region relatively close to our solar system. Don't worry if you didn't understand light year or, or the number of miles or everything or things like that. Just know it's easier to find them when they're closer to us. And then one particular telescope gave us um, a, a good number of these planets because it stared in one direction uh, for it looked at one part of the sky for about four years. So that's where we got that large amount of data from. There are a lot of uh, telescopes out there that, that had been and have been searching for planets around other stars. Of course, we've got the Hubble Space Telescope um, that has been used to photograph a couple planets and then also to follow up, do some follow up observations. The majority of the planets have been found using a, a spacecraft that was called Kepler. And uh, Kepler was the one that stared at one particular spot in the sky for about four years. And these others have been used and are being used now. TESS is a current uh, mission. The James Webb Space Telescope is supposed to launch later this year. And then there are some ground-based observatories, uh, the, the Keck, um, uh, observatories out in Hawaii and others. And so the the telescopes that we have and what is coming online soon uh, will be able to uh, give us even more information about these planets. Now, I gave you the, the teaser. The first planet found around another star was found in 1995. How many have been found to date? Well, as of yesterday, when I took the next screenshot, we have found 4,422 planets around other, around, another, around other stars. That's astonishing. Every time I do this talk, I have to do a new screenshot because that number goes up. Not only that, that's the number around 3,280 stars. So that gives you a sense that there is more than one planet around a good number of these stars. 
Now this number in the middle, 7,445, those are the candidates that we want to follow up with. They've been found in or suggested by one particular telescope or one method, and we need to follow up on them to confirm if those really are planets around other stars. And so uh, expect this 4,000 number to go up by many more thousand. Now, some of these will turn out to be not planets, um, but expect a good chunk of that of that 7,445 to move over to the left-hand column. Pretty amazing. Now, this all sounds well and good. It all sounds pretty easy, right? Oh, we find planets all the time. Well, that's true, but it is really wickedly difficult to do. And there are two really good reasons. It is hard to detect planets. They are small compared to their stars. Um, I'll give you a, a scale in just a second. But, I'll, but the main reason is stars are billions of times brighter than the planets. Stars make their own energy. Planets reflect light from their stars. If the light from the star is much more glaring than the planet, it's going to be very, very hard to find them, especially if the planet is close to the star. The closer the planet is, the harder it is to find it. Now, to give you a sense of scale as planets are small, well, I've been talking about Earth-like. How about Earth compared to our star, our sun? If our planet was a marble, and you filled our, our hollow sun with earth marbles, how many earth marbles would fill up our sun? About a million. So it gives you a sense of scale. Planets are bigger than their, their sorry, stars are bigger than their planets. Stars are a lot brighter than planets. And so that means we have to use a variety of techniques to find these things. Um, we can take a picture of a few of them, a small handful of them. And the technique is um, that we need to block the light from the host star. Um, so the, the telescope or whatever it is will have some way of blocking the light from the star, which allows the planet to kind of emerge from the glare. If we didn't have that technique, we would only be able to find planets that are really far from their stars, far from that glare. Now, about 50 planets have been discovered using imaging directly. Um, here is uh, one of them. This is a planet that has been found around this star called Beta Pictoris. Um, this is a dusty disk around this star. And there is at least one planet around that star. Now, this dotted line gives you a sense of the size of Saturn's orbit compared to where this planet is. So it is about the distance that Saturn, that Saturn is from our sun. But there really is a planet there. That one we can image directly. Now, we can't get any closer. You're probably thinking, hey, zoom in, right? Can we zoom in on that, on that image? No, we can't. Um, that's the best we can do. Now, if you want to get a sense of what it looks like there, this is an artist's rendition of what it might look like if you were near the planet uh, Beta Pictoris B. And so it might you might see the dusty disk around you. You'd see the, the bright light from the star off in the distance. Now, that's one thing that I think is the coolest thing about searching for planets around other stars. It means we are relying a lot on artists to give us a sense of what it might look like at these places. We can't, we can't see the surfaces of these planets. We can't do that directly. But artists give us a sense of what it's, what it's like to be there or to be near these planets and near these stars. So if you're interested in art, uh, this is where art and science really go together very, very well. Sometimes we look for the light from the star to change. And so I'm going to uh, start a little video clip. So if a planet is orbiting a star around a big circle, the planet, or sorry, the star orbits in a small circle. What that means is the orbiting planets cause the stars to wobble just a little bit in space. And it changes the color of the light that astronomers observe. When the star is wobbling away from us, the light is redder. When the star is wobbling toward us, the light is bluer. And we can see these changes. Um, and so over 860 planets have been discovered using this method. All right. Now, this is the one where we found the majority 
of the planets and it's called a transit. And what a transit is, think of it like a teeny, like a tiny eclipse. So whoops, sorry. So the planet goes around the star. And if the orientation of this system is such that the planet passes in front of the star, then that means the light from the star will dip, will dim just a little bit. And as the planet moves away, the, 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 the light from the star uh, goes back up to where it was. We can't see the planet directly. All we see is the dip in the light, the dimming of the light from the star. So again, the planet comes around. And if, when it comes around again, you, you then get a sense of the year for this planet because you've seen a dip happen twice. Once as it passed in front of the star and once as it passed around and in front of the star again. Now you need the planet system to be lined up just right. If you, the planet system is lined up just like I've got it on the screen here, if it's perpendicular to our line of sight to the star, you will never find this planet. You need for the system to be lined up so the planet passes in front of the star. And basically you stare at the star, you study the light, you see the light dim. And if the planet comes around again, the light dims again, again, that's then you've got that you then you got the year for this planet. Over 3,300 planets have been discovered using this method, and the majority of those came from the Kepler spacecraft. Now, if the light dims a lot, you can infer that that is a bigger planet. When the light dims a little bit, you can infer that that is a smaller planet. And about 1% of all planet orbits will allow us to see one of these, as we call them, transits, all right? So that is a very useful method. Again, we're not seeing the planet, not like here, not like this picture. Um, we're not seeing the planet we're seeing the dimming of the light from the star. Now this next one is gonna be confusing. If it's confusing to you, don't worry, it just is. So uh, forgive me in advance if this is confusing, I'll try to do my best to explain it. Um, so sometimes we've got a distant star and so you've got a distant star and it has, there is uh, a planet that goes around that star. If the planet lines up just right with us, the gravity of the planet will focus the light from the star, like a lens. The light from a distant star is bent and focused by, by the gravity of the planet as the planet passes between the star and Earth. And that causes the, the light from the star to brighten in a very specific way. And so we found about 100 planets in this way, but we see the light go up as the light is focused. And then you see this little tiny little brightening right here. That is a very telltale sign that there is a, a, a planet that is, that is focusing the light. The gravity of the planet is actually acting like a lens to focus the light from the distant star. Again, if that's confusing, don't worry. It just is. So, um, so just let that sink in for a while and, uh, and hopefully it'll get less confusing in the future. Now, the last uh, way is we look for star positions with respect to other nearby stars to change. And so the orbit of a planet can actually cause a star to wobble around in space in relation to nearby stars in the in the uh, in the sky. And so if you actually can see this wobble, you actually see the star moving in relation to other stars, then you can infer that there's a planet there. Um, because the stars won't just do that by themselves. There, there needs to be something else that's tugging on the star with gravity in order to do that. One planet has been discovered in this way. All right. So Really interesting that we have all these ways to find planets around other stars. We found different types of planets. Uh, planets that are similar to Jupiter and Saturn, we can call them gas giants. Um, we can call them Neptune-like if they're similar to Uranus or Neptune, especially in size. Super Earths are have more mass than Earth does, but, but they're lighter than Neptune is. And then we've got terrestrial, um, that would be Earth-like. But it's not just size. Where is this planet 
around a star. Is it closer to the star? This, this graph is showing you where we found the various planets. Are they closer to the star? How many planets have we found that take one day to go around their star? That's what this part of the graph is, one day or less to go around their star once. That's one Earth day. Um, 24 Earth hours to go around the star once. Several planets have been discovered in this way. They are close to their stars. We call those lava worlds because they are probably molten. We've got star. We've got planets that um, take up to a few hundred days to go around the star. Well, if these are uh, lower mass planets, we call them rocky. If they have more mass, they might be ocean worlds or ice giants. If they're really super massive, we might call them hot Jupiters. If they're far from their stars, we might, them, might call them cold gas giants. So is it a big planet? Is it a small planet? Does it orbit close to its star? Is it farther from its star? If it's close to its star, it's probably really hot. If it's far from its star, it's probably cool or cold. So Everything in between, what's the mass? How long does it take to go around the star? Um, uh, what size is it? All this stuff goes into our search for planets around other stars. Wouldn't it be awesome to find a lava world? Wouldn't that be cool? Um, I guess that would be hot. Sorry, pun not intended. All right, but everything is not always what it seems. When I gave this talk or a version of it up until about, oh, about a year ago, or so, um, I was able to say, look, we have a picture of a planet around another star. This star is called Fomalhaut. And this picture was taken by the Hubble Space Telescope and they blocked out the light from the star to see this dusty ring around the star. Look, there was a planet that we were able to follow over the course of eight years. And then we realized, no, this actually is not a planet. Well, it may have been, but it doesn't exist anymore. What we think happened was in 2004, we saw this thing not too long after it got hit by something. And over the course of several years, this thing followed along in its orbit and got bigger and dimmer and bigger and dimmer. This thing is possibly a planet or a, or, a, or a small world that doesn't exist anymore. It got hit by something big and it got obliterated. And so what we saw was the dusty stuff, the leftovers of that expanding outward. This is a no more planet. It may have been, it may have been some kind of smaller world, maybe smaller than a planet, but I can no longer show you that picture and go, yeah, there's a planet around that star. Science is awesome that way. We think we understand something, we learn some more information, and we go, whoops, we got that one wrong. And so look at what we learn now. You got to admit, this story is even cooler than, hey, we got a picture of a planet. At least that's what I think. All right. So what are some of these interesting places that we found? We to, I've talked about you can have planets that are Earth-sized and they've got atmospheres and we're learning what some of these atmospheres are like. And uh, we've got planets that are close to their stars and far from their stars. They're hot, they're icy. So how about some interesting places? First off, um, we've got a star that's the closest star to our solar system. It's called Proxima Centauri. It's not too much bigger than the planet Jupiter, but it is is—it is a star. No, Jupiter is not a failed star. Um, but this is, a plan this is a star that is a lot smaller than our sun. So here's our sun by comparison. Uh, but there is a planet around that star, at least one. Um, and so this is a side-by-side -side comparison. Here is our sun. Here is the size of Mercury's orbit. Mercury is the first planet in our solar system. Here is the size of Proxima Centauri compared to our sun. Here is the orbit of Proxima Centauri's planet. And lo and behold, that's a, it's a smaller star than our sun. It's a cooler star. Its habitable zone is a lot closer to the star. And this Proxima Centauri b seems to lie within that star's habitable zone. So that's pretty awesome. They're the closest star to our own solar system has a planet. Um, and if you were there, maybe it looks something like this. Do we know it looks like this? No. Um, but 
it could look something like this. And did you notice that, that there's other stuff off in the distance? There's two other stars in this system, Alpha Centauri and Beta Centauri. And so there are three stars in the system, but the planet goes around this star right here. Wouldn't that be a neat sky to see? How about this one? This is a planet called Ross 128b. It is likely Earth-sized. It is likely the same mass as Earth. It's only 11 light years away, meaning the star, the light takes 11 years to get here. So in terms of the vast majority of things in the universe, that's pretty close. For us, that's pretty far away. Um, but it's the second nearest known terrestrial planet to Earth. Even better, this planet may orbit in the inner edge of this star's habitable zone. Um, so its its year for this planet lasts about 10 days. Um, but this close orbit means the planet has the same side facing this star all the time. So one side of the planet always sees the star. The other side of the planet never sees the star. How interesting of a world is that? This is another planet. This is exoplanet HD 189733b. No, I did not memorize that. I just read it off the bottom of the slide. But this is the first ever map of the heat coming off the surface of another planet. The bright spot that you see in the, in the the uh, just off the uh, middle, that's the hottest part of that planet. And the rest of it, as you get toward the poles, is the coolest part. I'm, I'm not going to go into the details of what this could tell us. I just want you to please marvel at the fact that, A, we found planets around other stars. B, we found air around some of these planets around some of these other stars. C, we've been able to map the temperature of these stars. And it's, it's absolutely astonishing to me that all this has come about in 20 years. And so I'm showing you a temperature map for a planet around a completely different star. Just marvel at how neat that is. Um, this one, Kepler 452b, this is uh, probably the star that's most like our sun with a planet that is most like our own Earth um, in terms of size and in terms of age. Um, and so that is a really interesting place that we want to study more in the future. Um, its year isn't too much longer than an Earth year. Again, interesting places that we want to follow up on in the future. Do we know if this place can support life? No. Do we know if this place actually has water? No. These are all questions that we need to keep asking. I'm going to skip past the next one. Sorry, I had one extra one in here that I didn't want to talk about. But um, this system, this is a really interesting one. This is about 40 light years away, meaning the star called TRAPPIST-1 um, and that's the name of the telescope that studied this star. Uh, it's about 40 light years away, meaning the light from this star took 40 years to get here. This planetary system has seven planets. Sounds a lot like our own, doesn't it? And several of these planets are within this star's habitable zone. So if you take a look, at least four are within the star's habitable zone. Um, and so comparing that to our own solar system, we definitely have one within our habitable zone. Venus is just at the inner edge. Mars is just at the outer edge. This one may have up to four in the habitable zone of that star. What could it look like here? Well, you'd not only see your star, you'd see other planets nearby. They're that close together. How cool is that? And I know I keep saying that a lot. It just is. It's very awesome to me that we're able to see all this. Now, here is another really interesting place. This one planet orbits two stars. So this is called Kepler 16b. It's probably a gas giant like Saturn. Um, we don't know if it has rings like Saturn, uh, but it has a temperature probably similar to dry ice. But if you're a fan of Star Wars, and who isn't, um, then uh, yes, Tatooine does exist. Uh, there is a planet that can orbit two stars. Now, how about some really weird ones? How about this one? Kepler 7b. This is a gas giant that's 50% bigger than Jupiter, but it has half the mass of Jupiter. Let me put that another way. If you stuck this planet in a big giant bathtub, it would float. Um, so it, it's, it has 
uh, a mass that's less than that of water. Um, so, and I also want to point out, we're showing uh, uh, clouds in this artist's rendition of this planet. They have been able to map clouds, cloud patterns, large scale cloud patterns in this planet. So we've discovered planets, we've discovered air, we've discovered uh, what some of this air is made of. We discovered what some of these temperatures on planets of uh, some of these planets are. And for this planet, we can map the clouds. Science is really awesome. This one, this we think is, uh, it's called 55 Cancri E. Um, and we think that this planet uh, has a side that faces its star that's at about 4,400 degrees Fahrenheit. The other side is about 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. There's probably no air here. This very much could be that lava world that I was talking about. Just imagine what it could look like on this place. How about this one? This one. This is a different one. Planet J1407b. Um, this planet has a ring system 200 times larger than Saturn's ring system. Would that look awesome? This one, this is um, uh, planet HD 189733b, I think. Um, and it is so much stranger than our planet. Notice the color, it's blue. Oh, you think blue, wow, must be water there, right? No, this planet, uh, the daytime temperature of this planet is nearly 2000 degrees Fahrenheit. It is probably raining glass on this planet. It is probably raining glass sideways on this planet. It is probably raining glass sideways on this planet with winds that are approaching 4,500 degrees. The, the blue color of this planet doesn't come from the reflection of an ocean as on Earth, but a blowtorch to atmosphere containing particles uh, in the clouds uh, called silicates. And so basically it's melted rock. And so it is melted rock raining glass sideways in 4,500 mile an hour winds, giving you a planet that is the color of cobalt blue. And then finally, this one, WASP-12b. Um, it is a planet that is the size of Jupiter. It orbits so close to its home star that the star is tearing this planet apart. It only takes about one day for this planet to go around its star once, but the heat from the star is slowly stripping away the planet's atmosphere. In 10 million years, the star could very well completely consume this planet. And it is about two times the size of Jupiter, um, about 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit, and the gravity of the star is probably pulling this planet into the shape of an egg. So can you imagine what it looks like? And not only all that, this is one of the darkest planets we've ever seen anywhere. This planet absorbs about 99% of the light that, that hits the surface. Still got to figure out what exactly is covering this planet to make it absorb that much light. All right. So I'm going to stop sharing for just a second. By the way, if you've got questions, definitely uh, throw them in the chat. There's one thing I want to show you. Um, so give me just a second and I need to grab a web address and then I'm going to bring up internet on my end. I'm going to bring up that. I'm going to put this web address in the chat. So give me just a second. So if you want to actually go where I'm going, there we go. So I just put the web address in and I'm going to share my screen. So what I put in the chat is a link to uh, what NASA calls the Exoplanet Travel Bureau. Um, and so NASA's website, exoplanets.nasa.gov is a phenomenal uh, source of information about all things planets around other stars. Um, you can get the little movie clips that I showed you of the techniques that were that we use to find planets. You can get the latest information about how many planets we found and which techniques have found which ones. You can get to this, the Exoplanet Travel Bureau. Um, so we can click on uh, one of these planets and let us, oh, I don't know, choose this one right here, 55 Cancri E. And I'm going to scroll down and hit Explore the Surface. 
and it's going to load it up in just a second. It'll take just a second. All right. And they make sure to tell you you're viewing an artist's impression of what the surface of this planet could look like. And so I'm going to click and drag. So this could be if it'll actually click and drag, which it isn't. Of course, it was yesterday. Let me hit reload. <laughs> Don't you love technology when it works? All right. I'm going to. Oh, it is, of course, it's not working. Oh, there must be a lot of people going to this one. So, well, what you should be able to do is click and drag to be able to rotate the view. Um, let me go to a different one uh, because this is suddenly becoming so uninteresting for you to watch. Um, let's see if this one might work. I wonder if it's because I'm sharing. This actually did work yesterday. All right, viewing the surface of the planet. There we go. There we go. So I can move around. And there is information. If I click one of these links, it'll bring up information about the planet. So it's one of the planets in the sky. If I scroll around the other way. So you can get, an, again, an artist's rendition of what it could look like in this place. So we've got the Trappist-1 star. So not just the, the view that I showed you before. You can look up, you can look down, you can look all around. So they, are, they make sure they let you know hypothetical water. Um, we don't know for certain if water actually exists in this place. So I'll do one more of these. I'm really glad that actually worked. Um, so let me go to this one. I love this one, Kepler 186F. So we'll let this one load. All right, again, artist's impression. We can add an atmosphere if we want. There we go. Oh, it brings up some interesting hypothetical water. We don't know if water actually exists in this place. Um, purely speculative, but the star is a red color. And Hypothetical plant life. If the star is a different color than our own, if it's a red star, we don't have any evidence yet that there's life on this planet. But the plants, the plants on this planet, if they're there, would absorb the red light from the star, meaning the color of the plants might not be green like we're used to. They could be a different color. They could be red colored plants. We have green colored plants um, because our sun, for other reasons, but one of them is our sun gives off most of its light in the yellow green part of the spectrum. So it's not a coincidence that plants are green. Um, this star gives off most of its light in the red part of the spectrum. Would the plant life be red on this planet? It might very well be. So again, you can move around, you can move all around and take a look at what it could look like on this particular planet. Anyway, I just wanted to show the Exoplanet Travel Bureau um, and, and give you that link because that would be uh, uh, something really neat for you to explore. All right, questions, bring it on. I've got one from Nancy. Any news on the status of Hubble? I just checked yesterday. Um, so the latest is, oh, so if you didn't hear, um, the Hubble Space Telescope suffered a very serious anomaly. Um, it is in safe mode right now. What that means is if it doesn't, if it doesn't uh, detect that things are working well, it puts itself in safe mode saying, all right, I'm gonna shut things down. I'm just gonna be here. I'm just gonna charge my batteries and do my normal thing. I'm not gonna accept any, uh, any. I'm not gonna point at stuff and look at stuff in the universe and take pictures and stuff. I'm just gonna sit here until NASA fixes, fixes what the problem is. So it turns out that um, they're seeing the same problem. They're, they're having trouble communicating with a, um, uh, they're having trouble communicating with uh, several different computers on the telescope. So that means there's probably a root cause to this problem that isn't the computer um, because they're seeing the same problem across many different systems on the telescope. So. Uh, so they're still trying to narrow down where that is, but they've got some ideas that they're testing over the next few days. Um, so nothing to share yet. They haven't given up. 
um, it was sounding kind of dire last week, actually. The, the status I heard was, oh my God, is the Hubble Space Telescope mission over? And that's actually the first thing I heard, um, which was not good. But they're continuing to work through this problem. They've got some ideas for some, some root causes to this problem. They're just going to work through all of that. So nothing, nothing in terms of recovery at this point, uh, but they're definitely working on the problem right now as we speak. All right, Don. Oh, thank you, Don. Very nice comment. Thanks for the great graphics and detailed explanations that were easy to understand. It's always the the thing that I never quite know. Are you really going to latch on to the graphics and everything? Um, and again, that exoplanets.nasa.gov uh, website is um, you can go and get the exact same graphics and you can see all of that. Um, but what I love and what I really wanted to show you was an exoplanet travel bureau because it's one thing for me to give you static images. It's another for you to go and explore um, what, what some of these planets could look like. Um, there's another uh, site that I'm going to grab the um, web address for. Um, give me me just a second. It's called Eyes on Exoplanets. And, and it's at the site that I'm about to put in the chat. There we go. Um, there are different Eyes on uh, uh, versions for NASA. One of them is Eyes on the Solar System, um, where you can go see where all the spacecraft are currently in the solar system. It's computer generated, but you can go to that web link that I just put in the chat and you can um, go to Eyes on Exoplanets. It'll probably have you download a certain piece of software to your computer. It's legit. It's NASA. Um, and then you can go explore a catalog of all the located planets, all the planets that we found so far. And there should be artist renditions for many of them. So you can see what direction they are, what constellation are they in, what is the star like, what do we know about the planet so far, all that stuff. More information than I could ever possibly give you. So there you go. Two really cool tools um, that you can go and explore more for yourself. All right, Janet, any questions on your end? Any other questions from the audience before we sign off for tonight? I know there's, I couldn't possibly have answered everyone's question. <laughs> well, I, I, don't, I don't have a question and my mind is just swimming. It was so much great information. I had no idea that we had that discovered or identified that many planets. Yep. And just since 1995, right? Yeah, just since 1995. Oh my gosh. Oh. Yeah, there's, there, there was in 1995, when I first started at the Adler was June of 95. The number of planets we found run other stars at that point was zero. <laughs> um, and so the announcement was made, um, it was like a month or two or a few months later after that. And we've been discovering them ever since. The big ones, the ones close to their stars, we find mm -hmm. those first. Um, the smaller ones, Earth, Earth sized, we find, we've been finding more and more of those. And we're finding they are more the norm rather than the big ones. Um, mm -hmm. And just the key is, and I didn't give an answer at the beginning. I, I purposely did not give an answer to what does earth like mean? Um, because it honestly, it depends on who you ask and what mm. questions you want the answer to. Right. And so, so many variables, right? And so like the mass, yes. size, temperature, what, yeah, whatever. Mass, size, temperature, <laughs> um, uh, the length of year, um, uh, is it made of the same stuff? Uh, is it made of different stuff? And, and one question I get a lot then is, could there be life not like our own? Like, could mm -hmm. there be life not based on carbon and oxygen right. and all that stuff? And the answer is maybe. The chemistry mm -hmm. would be harder. Mm -hmm. um, the, the chemistry of carbon-based life is actually very... Um, uh, the, the chemistry works out much more easily uh, for carbon-based life than for life based on other elements. Uh, so but the answer is we don't know. We, we haven't know. found it. And I really did purposely talk about the UFO part, uh, <laughs> mainly because I'm not saying anything has visited here. No, <laughs> we don't have I, enough data yet. I want to believe. I'm a good I mean, X-Files fan. I want to believe. <laughs> I can see you do want to believe. <laughs> 
but it's just, I don't know, you gave us so much information, but as usual, it was very easy to understand. And Thank you. Because that's what I appreciate about your programs more than anything. You give us great information. It's always so interesting. And I always say, even I understand it because I do not have <laughs> mind for science but you you really really helped me well thank you and my goal for this is not to turn every single one of you mm -hmm. you're welcome nancy and the, the 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 goal is not to turn every single one of you into walking talking astrophysicists that is not my goal <laughs> my cool. goal is the next time you see a story about something like this you might read it you might go to the library and check out a book. You might go to the library, exactly. check out a video. You might uh, peruse through astronomy or sky and telescope magazines. Um, you might, I don't know, you're scrolling through, you're doom scrolling through through Facebook and you go, oh, wait, here's an interesting little little nugget of a story here. Maybe I'll read that. Um, by the way, the, the BBC um, website and app has a very good science and environment section. So if you're interested in science related stories, the bbc.com and go to the science and environment section. Um, there's usually some really good science stories and they often include astronomy related stories too. So it's another great source of, of uh, information outside of our own country. It is really interesting to get another country's perspective yes, that would on the be. news. So anyway, all right, last call for questions. Before Any we more questions up. before we let Michelle go? <laughs> Well, if not, um, thank you once again, Michelle. Hopefully you can be with us in person next time. Or as we discussed, if it's February and we get a foot of snow, you can be on Zoom. Absolutely. You know, if we this has opened up a whole new world for us. So absolutely. It's it's actually super fun to think mm -hmm. that we have options now. So yes. um so I look forward to seeing you all in person and if not in person over Zoom, um it, chatting with you sometime. Hope to see you at the Adler Planetarium when it's safe to do so and when we're fully reopened. Um but anyway, take care everyone and be well, stay safe and okay. uh, we will talk very soon. Okay, thank you. Good night everyone. Bye -bye. Thanks Bye -bye. for joining everyone.